Hi, everybody who's here. Um, we are currently at 52 participants and counting. Um, and welcome to the Flow Friday's Times Entanglement Show. We will probably um, get properly started um, in a short while, but um, welcome to all 52 of you who have tuned in early. You are slightly on time. It is six past, but you are relatively punctual. So <laughs> um, that's amazing. And thank you for, for coming to the show today. Um, I think we're good to start now as we'll be having an introduction. Um, so all other people who join will be able to join during this lovely introduction that we're going to have to um, this event. So welcome. Um, welcome to Flow Friday's Times Entanglement. And for background for you all, um, Flow Fridays is a platform for young poets, um, centering the voices of young poets of color. And we intermittently post content online. Um, we make videos and have discussions and also post prompts for poets. And recently, um, we've actually this year started a collective where we write every Friday um, and work together to um, build our poetry skills. Um, however, recently, um, within the past two years, we have started manifesting in a physical space. Uh, we're not just online. Um, and so this is our third event with the South London Gallery. Some of you may have come to our previous events um, where we were actually on site in Peckham. Um, and we've also had the honor to create work for the Welcome Collection and Clapham Library um, and have some events with them. But the um, primary goal of Flow Fridays as a platform is to rationalize, emancipate, and explore the complexity of being a young person here and now. Um, and so I think it's, it's amazing to have this space to host this event of Flowetry um, with you. And um, this event today was amazingly put together by the South London Gallery who are hosting this Zoom webinar that you are now part of. Um, and the tech team behind the scenes um, are the um, people who run the um, South London Gallery's Youth um, Art Club every week, um, Tommy and Paul, who you will not see, but um, many thanks to them for um, being the tech guys um, for this Zoom. And Art Assassins itself, who um, helped to create this event and who this event is in collaboration with, um, are the youth collective who do uh, weekly sessions at the South London Gallery and we have been exploring this colonial archive um, with re-entanglements which is a project um, started by Paul Basu, an anthropologist at SOAS and this colonial archive, British colonial archive, um, was created by North Cope Thomas um, well created by the colonial office but um, commissioned to North Cope Thomas and it the archive itself consists of ethnographic photos, um, botanical specimens and objects from West Africa, um, collected between 1909 and 1915 in Nigeria and Sierra Leone. And that's why this event has been contextualized as it is, um, as we are young poets of color, mostly from the African diaspora, exploring these themes that, that deeply entangle themselves and interlink with, with the archive um, that was collected in the 1900s. Um, and to give context to the archive itself, um, Northcote Thomas um, was the first government anthropologist um, assigned to do work in West Africa who had been officially trained as an anthropologist. So before that, the British government were just sending out admin staff to go and research um, regions of the world that they were colonizing. And they didn't actually have like a formal um, practice around it as anthropology was quite a new field to go into. So Norcote Thomas, the person who created the archive that we're responding to, um, was the first actually like classically trained anthropologist who did this work. Um, and he was sent to um, collect this information about um, West Africa in order to further the colonial project and create um, colonial policy from Britain in order to continue indirect rule in places like Nigeria and Sierra Leone. And once he arrived there, when he was told to um, go and do this work, uh, West Africa had actually already been occupied by Britain since 1897, which was in Nigeria specifically and Sierra Leone, 
um, when the British violently invaded and caused the fall of the Benin Empire, which is, side note, the reason why we have artifacts like the Benin bronzes in um, the British Museum today. It was caused by the raiding of palaces during this violent colonial project. And the Benin bronzes were actually um, artifacts, um, artistry made by artists and craftspeople within the Benin Empire depicting royalty and noblemen who actually largely governed parts of Africa um, up until only 120 years ago. So this is our recent history. And it meant that in 1909, when Northcote Thomas, um, the organizer of this archive visited, it had only been 12 years since um, these parts of West Africa had been made into British colonies. Um, and I just find it really interesting that we as poets, as creatives, as people of color, as people interested in speaking about the colonial histories of Britain are exploring this archive here and now. Um, given that we are living in, in a Britain that is now having to come to terms and speak about its colonial histories um, and the racial and economic implications of that. And um, we are literally um, digging up colonial legacies that we have today and, and the physical embodiments of it. Um, and in some places, throwing them into rivers. So it's quite apt that today we are exploring this physical manifestation of colonial legacy um, as people coming from our backgrounds and as young people being the voices of, of a new generation who are having to really confront some of these um, themes and topics throughout our lifetimes and within our spaces. Um, and so speaking of young people and speaking of the Flow Fridays Collective, I will now introduce you to the poets who are um, going to be performing today. Um, you might see them if this is in grid view currently. If you are on YouTube, Hopefully this is in grid view for you. Um, we have Rosa, Victor, Destiny, Tito, Antonia, and Sadie, who's also an art assassin performer today, um, as well as our esteemed guest poet and playwright, Inua Ellens. And before we um, go on to Inua, who I will allow to um, introduce himself, um, we are going to have a Q&A at the end of uh, this performance, the end of this float tree evening. Um, so please make sure that if any of the themes that come up in this performance, um, any of the questions that are posed, um, anything that piques your interest, you write a question about in um, the Q&A box if you're on the Zoom here now. And at the end of the show, when we start the Q&A, we will try our best to answer all of your questions. Um, but yes, we are now going to move on to Inua Ellens, our um, esteemed guest poet and playwright who is very well known for having written the Barbershop Chronicles and most recently um, he um, wrote this, um, the most recent adaptation of Three Sisters that was uh, performed at the National Theatre this year. So hi Inua. Hello. Hi, um, thanks for joining us. Um, it is an honor of mine to be here to share this space with the poets from, um, um, with the art assassins, with the poets who are working with the South London Gallery. Um, I did a project with the art assassins years and years ago, and it's great to see how the program has developed and to include these really brilliant minds. Um, my name is Inoue Alams. I'm mostly a poet, but now and then I get uh, too big for my boots and write plays and screenplays and radio plays and stage plays like Barbershop Chronicles, The Half Go to Rainfall and Three Sisters. Um, today I'm going to be responding to the poems um, written um, by the other poets tonight and um, poetry is a leap of faith at all times. The completion of any work of art when it's put before an audience which is you guys. So thanks for um, completing the equation with us. All we have written is mathematics, signs, and words, and additions. Um, yes, um, I'm, this is going to be a chain link of poems. And they're going to read some poems. And I'm going to take some of the words and see if I have poems that respond to theirs. So I haven't heard these poems um, at all. So I'm going to respond to them in real time. Um, so it was an experience um, for all of us. And it's an experiment for all of us. Um, Without further ado, um, we shall begin. All. We are trying to hear our heartbeats across the diaspora. Over the deafening silence of structural denial. 
and ideologies that give us only borders and deportations. We are in a dark place. Our scars have been taken away and replaced with bullet holes. This archive is a shock. Of a process that erased humanity many lifetimes ago. And that is only beginning to unravel it. Here. 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 Now. Now. Nineteen oh nine comes after eighteen ninety seven. Several years of a kingdom beheaded in clay, brass, and bronze, of ember families shriveled from head to toe on scorched earth. Flip like heads of crows and beats of magpies pillaging homes to the hum of our own built by the millions, brick laid for the proletariat. Is it different to be British now? As then when bodies hung like badges on the double breast of heartless men eating gold from headless armies and eggless hens we plucked feathers from to study her hair the way she wove it between the same fingers that wove hay with the intricacy of the masks she made, the scalps she tore through to protect with braids between knives as ruthless as teeth. From toothless picks and camera clicks and rolls of film with measuring sticks, hope. Was colonialism inevitable? cloaked in coats of arms and arms of choking lungs in warfare, shipped in curious violence. From north, up north, where voyeurs gawked and scientists talked eugenic tongues on western borders. Was it a fair trade? Are all heads destined to fall from grace? and all knowledge lost from the decapitated whose 2,000 heads have grown diasporas. The same of an archive, an asylum seeking political migrant with a student visa who was denied home in claims that it no longer exists. Will these sounds, objects, photos ever live if they cannot die and their ontologies have been colonized by skulls and bones 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 the scientific study of humanity Maybe it just doesn't agree with my philosophy, one that sees humans as persons, two realities inseparable, one who wouldn't pay for knowledge with the price of undermining what I'm knowing. The ideal anthropologist looks only at society's surface, but one, is it possible to ignore the colonial baggage buried in our minds and bodies emerging like a zombie from the ground through the actions of our hands? And two, is the surface enough? Surely their own story, in their own words, buried under yours, needs to be told. We see pictures of white men guarded by earth-coloured shirts and dirt-coloured chinos, next to black children, bare-chested, bare-hearted. He marvels with artistic chants and dances for them to be marked by numbers. In more ways than one, they can't speak to each other. Yes, wells and medicine are good for the body, but the way to gain a soul is to hold it in the way it knows how to be held. Unfortunately, the world documents communities the only way they know how, not for who they are, but for who they are to them. 
Does my self-projection match my eye's vision is the question asked. We do not look at who they are when we attempt to understand. We look for who we think to find, who we conceive in our mind. And the killer is, we almost always succeed. I wonder what those studied people saw. Those that have never left their country, do they see our planes in the sky and wonder why their people haven't grown metal wings yet, why their people can't fly to other lands? I wonder what would happen if the people were educated enough, motivated enough at the time, had enough free time to be unconcerned with survival and had the chance to tell their own story to the world, to hold their own narrative in the way it is to be held with care and attention and the understanding it deserves. If it is to be told to the world, their version of events is surely the one that should matter. The version where Britain is not the epicenter of the world as they told, the version where their own culture and tradition is the core, the heartbeat of the lands that they come from. We have told a story through these archives. It's time we tell the story. And maybe that won't come immediately. Maybe it'll only come when those societies are as developed and as educated as ours, these ones. But maybe then they will become so concerned with advancing with our tech that they forget to document what makes them different, forget to create wealth after their own written word, a wealth worth more than the world's weight in gold. I wonder, is it up to the diaspora to go home and tell the stories of their ancestors? They have a genetic pull after all, and the education necessary to to do justice, not only to spot the cogs in the machine, but to speak to the ancestral spirits inside it, hear the heartbeats of the people, translate the soul of that society for those ill-informed to read into their history. Our version of events is to be molded by us, given to the world by us on our terms. Is that too much to ask? Versions. Versions. We had actual societies made up of kingdoms and civilizations, communities and empires. Why can't we go back to our glory days, back to the Bantu knots, wrapped and woven on missed intelligent minds who articulated Bantu philosophy, a demonstration of black excellence, setting foundations for what we call God, knowledge, moral code and the afterlife today. But to dig even deeper, we reach the first origins of humans, some of the earliest remains 90,000 years ago, right at the heart of our earth, my home, Congo. But then I must reluctantly pull the lever of the TARDIS with sweaty palms, low-key shaking, because I am fearful. Fearful of the suffering I am to witness, intergenerational trauma of my families, my country's histories, passed from bloodline to bloodline, finally reaching mine, into which I carry to the 21st century. And I wasn't wrong, my eyes burn at the suffering the people before me underwent, shipped off to be slaves in the 15th century, but also the stationary slaves of the 1800s, where Leopold made us enchained to our resources, to ivory, to rubber, to gold, all to steal for his personal gain, followed by a sprinkle of um, bodily mutilation when these demands were not met. So I was broken off, snapped off the branches of my family trees, branches severed in quick successions, finally poisoning the ethnic roots, something that I can never truly find again something so abstract yet so endearing taken away since the top of the food chain believed they were entitled enough to snatch it from me, tearing my history into shreds. The process of erasure was near complete, but it's not entirely the end. Here you are. It begins with the shackling of necklaces across throats. The distorted custom of wearing amulets to battle, talismans to war. We are new hunters. We are genes for camouflage, clutch mobile phones like spears, journey to the village, town, city, square, and meet the rest of the tribe, mostly in short skirts, armed with stilettos, armored by Chanel. 
dusk thickens. The customary bickering between us commences through the jungle vines of power lines, stampede of zebra crossings, night growth of streets bustling. Our ritual is natural till the traders come. Greater armed, they divide with such ease that most of us are taken. Those who resist are swayed by liquor deals, sail to darkness where the master spins a tomb, not our own. We move stiffly to it as minds force indifference, but spines have a preference for drums. Rage building, we make our melody fight to find our feet until the master tries to mix our movement with his song but the rhythm is uneven and the tempo wrong. Against its waves, we raise voices in anger, fists in protest, the dance of the tide, militant against the music, a million men marching through seas. But we still know how to cross water. The ocean holds our bones, explains our ease of navigating past bouncers like breeze into night's air where clouds pass like dark ships and find us beached, bench with parched lips, loose limbed and looking to light. Now, the best thing about clubbing is not this or the struggle to make hips sway just so, nor the need to chart cloakrooms as if through underground railroads. Nah, the best thing about clubbing is the feeling of freedom on the bus ride home. Rosa. The beginning. In the beginning of all this nonsense, the white man tried to make sense of something outside of his world. He took a ship not a whip, and ventured to Africa, the motherland. With pride and a closed mind, he photographed exhibit a woman stands, body barely compliant, her breast a teardrops into the dust that covers the tales of truth. See, our stories are not bestsellers in bookshops, but in whispers, in dreams. The art of storytelling comes from we. Exhibit, be careful what you believe. Who you trust to teach you your history. Exhibit C is what they failed to do. Their imaginations were the only wild, wretched beasts. Exhibit Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z are for the bourgeoisie to take and frame and prod. Yet in English galleries, there is a line you do not cross. Two meters from the piece of art is where you stop. For context, my vexation lies with this nation from their operation to dissect and disembowel the fruits of Africa, the art of Africa. For context, my vexation lies with the devastation and the duration of the torment. They really thought we were the ones in need of salvation. Savages to salvage from creativity, prosperity, from being free. For context, my vexation lies with a little condemnation, no reparation in every generation. They look past it to a future of repeating history's mistakes gifted in the wrapping of neo-colonialism, neo-imperialism. 
the prefix versus the dawn of new hugging onto old. And so the beginning was the end of freedom. Legacy. Legacy. The white man's burden has a legacy. Taking the land and bestowing Christianity. Creating legacies of pain. Generations marginalized and fear ingrained. Freedom fighters branded terrorists then restrained. The land of its natural resources, it was drained. The people only lost, the colonizers only gained. Tell me about the white man's burden again. It's the unjust truth they never say, reparations they never pay, apologies they never make, responsibility they never take. That's the recipe you follow to create a British identity misinformed and fueled on hate. Why are the links never made between empire and its legacy today, whether that's here or away? Rebranding. That's what Britain does best. They always teeter around the past, never take it on the chest. Always the best at avoiding accountability. So easy to sell an image of the monarchy. They always talk about how they like it, never from which country they stole the tea. It's confrontation that's feared. Why are all those diamonds still in the beers? Pressure makes diamonds, but under pressure, they'll crack. They're made of their greed and they don't want to give back. There's no just cause for greed. No law, no plausible cause, no need. Britain may have abolished slavery, but it is not until the people resume control that we will really be free. Freedom. Freedom. I want a tattoo. I want my skin to bear witness to the truth. Rebellion, resistance, whatever the cause of my persistence, I need my face, my hands, my limbs to tell the stories of, to sing the hymns of, a people whose words were mistranslated by those who hated their sable skin, by those who branded their ways, their worship as mere whims and I could hide it under my Sunday best. So maybe my marks could be proof of my life's success. I'll bear the names of lovers, scriptures, like a chief's prize sketches of scarification. But many in the church may think sorcery of tattooed me. Savagery may be all they see. But back in our motherland, my patterns would mean papacy, not contamination. And I've heard that a tattoo is heresy, offence against the God of Abraham, doodles on Christian arms, ink staining my palms makes me less righteous inside, makes me as idolatrous as the worship of morals in the motherland, makes me question if this dogma is that which has held us back, if in modernity we remain spiritually colonised. But here in the West, lest we forget that even the sight of clear black skin is treason. Another reason to validate how systems discriminate. My black skin makes me question what hallucination or hubris would make me want to do this to scale track and graze my flesh when a dark hue with a tattoo reads convict, criminal. Why would I want to confirm their preconception? And the American dream becomes a nightmare for those with Aztec prints and ancient hymns scribed on their body. But I want to be a canvas. I want you all to view my art gallery. Sleeves needled on ebony, 
my skin will share my homeland's history from our perspective, my body as a collective of colorings showing Africa's true glory, not the popular fallacies. Oh, my parents, the teachers and preachers of assimilation. They'd be so ashamed of the trails I blaze, they might say, how could we raise a girl who lets pain leak like paint on her face and cloud her gaze of the world? But still, I want a tattoo. Because I'm black if I do, I'm black if I don't. The catch 22 started with the skin I bear. So when I get it engraved on my flesh, I'll hide mine the way they hide theirs. Hide. Seek. Through his eyes, he has earned the right to understand the unknown. Through no works of his own kin, but his heart and inherent angelic schemes. It seems that he is the scholar, the one to study the touched but barely acknowledged former colony thoroughly, find out about a common wealth that his people grabbed and shook for loot rather than valuing it. We're doing them a favor, favor, he thinks, believes, but he sees a culture that lives and breathes and thrives. He thought he would be their eyes, ears, limbs, lungs, but he sees and interacts with a society that has their own set of senses, seeing the world through their own perspective, their own perspective, not a rental, not a projection owned by one who is somehow separate and tainted by a land that did take turns. Lord knows they didn't take care. The motto has always been divide and conquer. Use cameras to document the change, otherwise you're doing it wrong to make the queen proud. In his eyes, nothing was the same since slavery. It was basically God's plan for those people. Laws change overnight. Attitudes don't die easily. Through their eyes, it's something they've all seen before. A man travels to a country he does not know to gain what he cannot find at home, to take it back to where he came from. Sell what hasn't been seen and swim in the Mediterranean ocean of profits between their continent and ours. Knowledge only gains to be a commodity to his people. Look how much we know. Look how much we've done for them. We've told them about themselves. Crossing borderlines, not for me and mine, but to take what I have to those who don't and sell it for 10.99. Is that the value of my society, people and land? Yes, you may make a bond with us only to sell it back home and withdraw, 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 withdraw. Through my eyes, a man gets to travel to a country unknown, plain fueled by a spluttering imperialism and curiosity. His job is to ask good questions and get good answers. Who are they? How do they work? Who do they say they are? What do they stand for? He flies to a people with a countenance as curious as his, a people accustomed to asking questions without getting answers. Who is he? What does he want? Who does he think we are? How can he stand here? Colonized on colonizer, different sides and shades of the same mirror, viewing life with the same biological eyes, both being classed as human. Only I doubt they would both see it that way through eyes that can't let go of what they have seen in you are. Fuck Kipling. If I'd been there when he wrote The White Man's Burden, if I'd seen the half devil, half child line form in him. If in reaching for his neck, I tipped his inkwell. If gallons spilled like black blood across the middle passage, if we fell into it and washed up back on Gold Coast shores, I would spur him inland at gunpoint, find a village in which it's practiced, force Kipling to watch the punishment unfold where forsaken execution or confinement after wrongdoings, 
the accused is stood in a large circle before every man, woman, and child who recount tales of the guilty's good deeds and kindness. Two days this lasts before the circle is broken to celebration and the guilty welcomed back to the tribe. Then I'll lean in to whisper in Kipling's ear before squeezing the eager trigger. Such kindness is what we devil child do and our shit is too good for you. Rosa. Mahogany, drenched in berries, carved and caressed into cultural candle. Scarification scraped into being, eyes as crescent moons, lips pouted in a shh. We hold the mask up to our faces, transcending into different places until our face melts, becoming the mask it always was. Profile. Profile. Anthropology pictures for a catalog uh, straight in hair, no face marks. Get a number, seven, three, four, thank you. Hybridity. They are forced to be all and to be none. Can you truly have a conversation with a man you just number? Can you listen to somebody while you strip them of their items? Do you learn from them while you dress them to your like? Do you learn how to braid while you straighten their hairs? Do you feel the marks in their face while you try to cover them? Do you respect their God while you profane it? A young man, profile, picture. His marks were his crimes. Anthropologists, you didn't came to colonize, right? The greatest colonization was never violent. That ended rather fast. You came, you saw, you shot. With that camera, you captured the light and it's all still so dark. Knowledges. Knowledge? Knowledge. The S for you was too long. Tell me again, anthropologists, did you raise everything of them? What is left? What do you think of them? Because you went there but learned nothing from them. All that is left of them is the light you have prisoner in your camera, in the picture that categorizes them like anthropologists. If you would have only done things right, if you have listened rather than listed, you will have noticed there are not so many differences but you silence them, you strip them, and you repainted them to your own like. No, now all we have is a catalog. It's a picture of somebody we do not know. What else could you have done than to conquer them and sell them like merchandise? After all, isn't this just a catalog? You gave us a book of difference. Don't you understand? They colonize their bodies, but you colonize their minds. And how do you get out of that? Huh? Now, South London is full of hybrids. Straighten hairs, no face marks. They don't know who they are. You capture their light in that little machine of yours you call camera. Anthropology pictures for a catalog, no stress in hairs, no face marks. A smile is rather not. Get a number, 734. Customs. Customs. 
Colonialism and celebration. <laughs> Oil and water often stir together when they were never meant to mix. This is not a celebration. This is a presentation of the truth form. They were not meant to celebrate us more than them, more than they did. We are not meant to celebrate what they did, only who they did it to. It's just, it's hard to ignore. We only know so much about our ancestors because of where they went, what they did. Colonialism and celebration, they must be separated. Whether we like it or not, we are where we are. And we have what we have because they did what they did. But I refuse to see it as an inherently good thing. They did what they did based on the premise of ownership a method of colonial governance upon our ancestors. We were a subject of study, but we were not to study. We were not to study them, but we do not need to study to know their true intentions. They were to be celebrated. The splitting image of the white Messiah that they showed us, they made themselves the saviors. Colonialism and celebration, they cannot both be entertained. We cannot taint our own view of the culture after its mishandling. Our ancestors had pride in their culture for a reason. Traditions practiced for generations, not just a season. No wonder the culture drew and still draws global attention. They didn't arise, arrive for us, but they stayed for fascination because you can't ignore the light of our culture. The black star shines and our culture is brilliant. Just look at the archives, look at the evidence. A cause for celebration despite colonialism. You can't have one without the other. There's no diaspora without imperial conception, no culture in its current form without the formation it went through. Went through. This freedom wasn't free and the independence was expensive. This truth, it has depth, but the thing is we've been out of focus. The background is not the focal point. We need to bring the people's story to the forefront. They deserve to be celebrated for who they are before Britain saved them, gave them back to themselves. They were already warriors able to fend for themselves. So let's celebrate them. Not because of triumph over those that freed them, but for them. For existence is enough reason for celebration. Celebration. Tolerance. South London, Croydon. I met this boy. He named himself Lupo. It means wolf in Italian. I wonder if that is the name he chose when he was going through Italy to get here. How old was he? You know, I see, I see him, I see through him. But my white friend, she can hide it. She sees the marks in his face and he sees her. He sees the pity. He quickly, just, he quickly tries to explain, I chose them. She doesn't understand, she thinks it's pain. He says, there are not many of less up left, there are not many left of us. I must go back, I must get more, it's part of my tribe. But she thinks, he's a South London boy. <laughs> he soon goes to college, he wants to be a lawyer, the marks on his face, what is him? She doesn't understand, he tries to explain. There is no ears, only eyes. Inua. They asked why we came here. We replied to master the meticulous small talk of whether sharpen instincts of forming ordered cues, consume bland food, buckets of foreign beer, chant football slogans at quiet commuters and await good news from Northern Nigeria. And the arrival of what news did we wait for? We described Plateau State burning itself, a spreading undercurrent of intolerance from the steeple-like hills to the moon and the star-studded de desert. In the hot, stifled places of worship, what we felt was hot, stifled, a construct by the thugs of the British Empire. And what could we tell them of the time before this? We spoke of old Sokoto, 
It's a name that screams of Hamartan winds blowing through afternoons, watching its slow drift cloak the sun in gold dust. What enchanting mystery the sky would become. And this was all we feared before the empire's arrival, the shuddering nights after, and the gold light gone. And where did we think our gold light went? They were amused, patient. In those early days, we hadn't yet been refused. At our next immigration hearing, there were seven older, hard-talking skeptics, a clerk squinting, a pen between his teeth. Their minds were made, the questions random. Could a car of armed men crush a mustard seed? Did we think their guns came on Afghan wings? Is the Queen Haram, John the Baptist, black? What message could a burning cross send back? We were to help clear up their confusion, they as anxious as we were to be done. We had our nightmares, the scars on our skin, and that white room in which to convince or confess. All. Listen. Listen. Because we are trying to hear our heartbeats across a diaspora. And we hear them in muffled tones through the instruments that deny us our hearts and our lungs. We want the universal right to breathe again. To speak and to be listened to in a bubble of those hoarding air, privilege, power in glass boxes and through glass ceilings that mine our communities for wealth and convince us that we are benefiting from it listen listen because you can't fix a system that was made to divide and conquer and shatter since the racial ideology was made to marginalize us we haven't mattered so we have no choice but to reimagine what we are. Listen. Listen. Sometimes severed ties are the strongest type of violence that bind us to broken systems. Listen. Listen. Britain has beheaded its ancestors, hung, drawn, and courted the world and remove the larynxes from ancient knowledges. So they no longer sing in the right frequency. Listen. Listen. To who gets to speak? There are no ears, only eyes. Who gets to be silent? There are no ears, only eyes. And what structures must be dismantled for us to be able to breathe? Thank you everyone for tuning in today to the Flow Fridays Times Entanglements Poetry Evening. Thank you to all the poets who performed today um, and thank you for all staying tuned for the Q&A which we will start now. Um, so if you have any questions and you want to really explore the themes that we performed today, please message your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom. Um, I cannot beautifully give an example of it because it's a screen, but um, it's there. And um, please do not hesitate. We are all friendly. We don't bite. Um, and we'd really love to, to explore some of the things, the themes, the wording. Maybe you heard a line and it was your favorite line and you want to really like unpick it. Maybe you want to ask Inua some questions. Um, maybe you want to ask us as a group to respond to some of the things that, that it really um, engaged you to think about. Um, and maybe you want to just have a discussion about what an archive like this means in Britain today, or even what the topic of British colonialism means in 2020. So yeah, everyone post your questions in the Q&A box and um, we will start 
speaking. I think I will get questions through um, eventually. Um, so I, I don't think that anyone's got any questions yet and you're probably just all very nervous. Um, so firstly, I wanna ask um, any of the poets if you have any questions that you're dying to ask. If not, I will ask a question um, to everybody instead. But if you're dying to ask a question, poets. Feel free. I do have a question. I want to know how can other people can get involved with art assassins in the future? And um, yeah, a little bit more about the project. Okay, awesome. So um, me and Sadie are actually art assassins now. So I guess we'll take um, that question. Um, Sadie, do you want to start? I feel like I've spoken a lot today, so. Sure. Um... Well, like it's free, <laughs> just it's in a uh, South London gallery. So it's in the attic at the top. And this project, we were supposed to have a gallery space. So obviously we were all supposed to be there right now performing this in person, um, but we are continuing the work on this project. I've missed a couple of sessions. So I don't know what we're currently doing, but I know that Paul has asked me um, to start talking about making the zine. So we think about making a zine and then maybe we would print the poems from this event into that. Cause I think they were also, like even to see the words, they're really visually beautiful poems anyway. They're really like visually written. So I think we could maybe make art inspired by that as well. So I, that's something that could definitely anyone could get involved in if they want to. We'll be starting that in September and then yeah, now we're doing, for now we're doing Zoom calls. For now it's Zoom calls and making like a kind of, we finished our Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo gang f film. But yeah, anyone can turn up. It's in Camberwell at in South London Gallery and it's very good. There's ginger snaps and everything you could want. Hopefully we can maybe post, find a way to post a link to um, the South London Gallery website so that you could potentially sign up to it through there. Um, but yeah, if you're between the ages of, I think it's 14 and 21, um, you can come along. We have sessions every Tuesday, but yeah, because of COVID we're currently social distancing. Um, but at the moment we are still working on responding to the archive. And um, Sadie would have missed some of the sessions and I've missed some of the sessions recently, but we're currently working on um, producing a kind of soundscape in response to some of the wax cylinders that um, were make up the archive. So yeah, if you do want to get involved, that would be something that you could potentially work on as well as um, potentially working on some stuff for a physical exhibition we might have later in the year. So yeah, I hopefully see you there. Thank you guys, sounds amazing. Okay, so we've got um, some more questions coming through. Amelia, hi. Um, the question is, what was the experience of working together like? Did you write separately and connect themes or craft collectively? How was that experience creatively? Um, so I can speak about how we kind of like design this process and then I'll like open it up to all the poets, including Inua, as to how it all kind of finally came together. Um, so the first, the initial kind of prompt to this um, was the fact that as art assassins, we have been working on this archive and we knew we were going to have an end of year um, kind of show to showcase the things and themes that we've been exploring as like a group of artists. Um, and then it just so happened that because I'm an art assassin, but also run Flow Fridays that um, it would have been ideal just to have a poetry response to some of these themes that um, we thought were really interesting to explore through like an artistic lens. Um, and so I think working together has been really great. Through Flow Fridays, we um, pitched a kind of prompt out on Instagram and maybe another platform. I think it was on Instagram. Um, and who anybody who follows our Instagram, which um, is at Flow Fridays underscore UK, um, if you want to get involved in any future things. But anyone who followed our Instagram um, applied. And then with the art assassins, we worked to choose the poets that we wanted to have in this final show. 
Um, so we work cross collaboratively over two artistic platforms, Flow, um, Flow Fridays who work on poetry and then the art assassins who um, do mixed media art in general. And then we all wrote to this theme of the Northcote Thomas archive. So we had prompts um, of um, media collected from the archive. So there were some botanical specimens in, in the original prompt we had, I think there were masks, um, there were the kind of the things that were collected that were um, that the archive comprised of was really the inspiration for this piece, as well as the overarching themes of, of Britain, British colonialism, West Africa, Nigeria, Sierra Leone. Um, and then what you heard tonight was really the product of all of these things mulching together, crossing over with our lived experiences as people from the diaspora, also as people who have explored colonialism um, within our own context. Um, and then how was the experience creatively? Um, so guys, I guess you can you can answer this one. Like, what was it like working together? What was the experience like for you all? Let me unmute myself and take that. I think, yeah, it was good. I think, do you know what? You see with art, yeah, especially when you're all writing from the same prompt, you see different people's different perspectives on the same thing. And I think because it's through a creative medium such as poetry those differences are kind of accentuated or accentuated because you might be talking about the same thing but the way you choose to write about it the metaphors you will include and the references you will include there they come from different places so I think it's when you're doing something like this it's just interesting to see people's perspectives on the same thing and also I think as Sadie was referring to how it kind of and we spoke about this before as well how it kind of all comes together or how it has come together as one kind of big collective piece about this issue. So yeah, I think it's been really rewarding in that sense. So yeah, that's what I'll say. I also yeah. kind of want to ask Inua how you found it and then Destiny, oh, sorry. Destiny. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, feel free. Destiny and then Inua. Oh, um, oh okay. So um, for me at first, um, the whole prompt in itself, um, I felt was quite retrospective. Like it really took me a while to honestly just like sit down and reflect on like my own past and like how I was able to, I guess, project it to other people that don't know. And I think that in itself, like, you know, like had a little, like, had a little breakdown and stuff. And like now it feels so much more enriching and just to be able to share that. But not only that, but to be able to hear um, from people who, um, have a similar experience, not quite the same, but similar. Like, um, it feels good that like, we all sort of share that, um, I would like sort of hurt, but like, um, we all share that medium to be able to express it in a way that's so beautiful. And I like, I absolutely loved it. And like for all of us to come together and for everyone else, like on the outside who are listening to like, it's, I, I feel really connected despite like social distancing and whatever. And yeah, it's just, it's just been amazing. Um, hi, um, I, I just really enjoyed um, listening to the work, listening to your brains at work and listening to the connections you had made and, and thinking of strands that I could find in, in my work to sort of represent, to echo, to support, to, to work in parallel um, with your work. So I was, I, was, I, was, yeah, I was listening to the poems in real time and, and thinking. So it was, it was really great listening. And just and just yeah, and just seeing the connections, the echoes, the repercussions, and the reverberations running right through your work, and to think you guys created this without really spending time together in isolation is, is really, is, yeah, it's really magnificent. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you, and a round of applause to all the poets and for managing to bring this all together without meeting each other physically once which was definitely a very difficult process. Um, okay, I'm gonna collectively do some questions as we are getting a few more questions in. So I'll do two at once now. So um, Tatenda, hi, uh, said, what impact did the archive have on your writing process? And then, um, and then Paul, ah, hi Paul. Um, <laughs> you organized the re-entanglements project said, um, really moving, can you tell us how engaging with the archive inspired your words? 
were there specific photographs or objects that moved you? So um, both the questions really like linked together. One was what impact did it have? And one is a bit more specific. Were there any specific, specific like photos, um, prompts that you really took from the archive to make the work what it is? If you can remember. Oh, come back to me. Uh, I'm going to find the prompt now, like really quickly, and then I'll okay. answer it. Come back to me. Um, I think, because obviously at Art Assassins, we've been looking at it as well, and like we've been thinking about it, but it was really when we went into, I was kind of sad that I didn't get to see any of them in person because everyone else got to see like the wax cylinders, but I joined like a bit late into the project. Um, but I did see like photos and then I did hear the sound recordings like for, through just like on a computer. But um, I think it all really clicked when there was a like online session that we did with Emma Dabbery and that was just like, whoa. And she did this whole talk where she was talking about like the three weapons of colonialism being the gun, the Bible, and then the camera. And sort of the way she was talking about the camera, I think that just I don't know. I was. I was. I wish that I'd written something else off of it because I never thought of it as this thing. Because at the time she was talking about the fact that in Britain at the time for someone who was upper class, it was offensive to them if if their photograph was taken because a photograph was something if it was of a person was something that was to document them as an object, and I never thought about that. Like it was such a. Just she did a whole talk about the whole politics and philosophy of like the photographs that are being taken and just thinking about the nature of them as well. There's quite a few photographs that were really demeaning and objectifying and just, I don't know, there was quite a few points you made. And yeah, that call, I'm, <laughs> I need to think more about that call because there was something in particular she said, but it was that, that her saying that the three weapons included the camera and thinking of photographing as this really violent sort of medium. Um, but yeah. Um, I know Victor said he was thinking. Um, Tito, Rosa, Destiny, Antonia, what yeah. really inspired you from the archive? For um, me, it's, oh, do you want to go, Antonio? No, no, you go first, I'll go after. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, for me, I think it's interesting because I Did she froze? Yeah. Oh, Tito, are you there? Okay, Can maybe I... Antonia, you take it uh, while... Yeah. Well, she comes back. Yeah. Um, I think what inspired me from the f f files and the pictures that were sent and everything was just seeing how dehumanizing they were. Although it is not easy to see it like plain sight. I feel like, well, I study politics and international relations and my favorite topic is decolonization and, and the colonial theory. And before I will see these anthropologist pictures in museums and I'll be like, oh, this is so cool. Like, you know, and then now that I understand, it's just like, this is so dehumanizing. This is this. And that's why my first poem was all about the camera being um, what captured their light. And if you can truly make a connection with a person while you are like treating them like merchandise, because essentially that was what was happening. And I feel like we were always taught that anthropology is a science that is studies like humans and, and things like that. Um, but I think that the pictures or in the colonial times that I believe it still happens, um, is quite dehumanizing and it's quite othering. And, and it's just the process of, of not colonizing their bodies yet, but colonizing their minds and, and objectifying them and, and creating this distance this othering, this, this enemy or friend dichotomy. And it's, it all starts with this friendly picture. I feel like if it was really about learning, they would have sit down, learn the customs, ethical anthropology. Um, 
So just seeing, I don't know, for example, there was one picture that the guy was, and I talk about it in my poem, that there was one guy and he was holding, I think, a number. It seems like it was like a headshot for like a prison. And I was like, don't you, don't you see how, in, how symbolic this is? Like prisons were actually made, um, racialized, like prisons have a history to be, um, you know, places of punishment for those that are others. And just seeing this picture of an anthropologist and not a gel that looks like a gel, it just, uh, it just says so much. It says so much about othering and, and yeah. So I think I, what inspired me from the pictures to write the poems about the camera taking the light and the life out of these people was just seeing how dehumanizing they are, although they don't look like you have to like read through it, you know? But yeah, I think that. Yeah, I can say something on this too. Um, I think with my first poem, like it involved a lot of like references to the archives. Like when I, when I was referencing like exhibit A, exhibit B, like going, going through exhibits and things like that. Um, and I don't think that was necessarily intentional. Like I, I looked over the pictures, I looked over the prompts and then I kind of took a step back from it. Um, and didn't really think about it for a while because there was so much going on and like a lot of emotions involved but also the pictures were saying so much um so yeah it was hard for me to like think of something that could en encompass and relate to um like the, the various aspects um that the archive covers so um yeah after taking a step back um i I incorporated it into the poem, so like with the, um, a woman stands body barely compliant, like that whole bit is like a picture in the archive. And I don't think, I don't know whether I actually realized, um, I think I wrote it and then looked back and I was like, oh wait, I did see this. I just didn't register it. Um, so some of it was just um, like in my head and it was just coming from that, um, yeah. And, I just use that structure of like exhibits to flow through my poem. I think for me, um, Antonia said it already, to be honest, it was the numbers thing. When I saw that picture of the basically mugshot with, you know, the number, that him holding up the number and him, and also Northcote kind of numbering each individual thing that people did, such as the chants and dances. That's where most of the ideas for the poems came from kind of those three elements, the camera, the number, and, you know, their perspectives and how they saw everything, yeah. Wait, sorry, can I quickly say, in relation to Rosa and Victor's poem, that's what was really making me think about, um, like, the archive, like, especially, obviously, Rosa talking about Exhibit A, like, each of the exhibits, yeah. and then Victor said, at one point, it was about the man in like khaki standing with children. And I think I was remembering like the uh, talk that we had with Emma, she was talking about, well, I don't, I'm not on first name terms, Emma Dabry, but she was talking about um, the politics of the camera up until today. And it really just, all of it came together. Like, you know, people will go to Africa on like a kind of like missionary trip. Like all of these people will go as if, that, as if they're helping or doing these people don't even need help like do they not realize it's such like a it, oh it's just really pissing me off and then they go and they're taking pictures of children you're not going to go to to London and go and go and take a picture of a homeless child when do you ever see a picture of like a child in in Europe like we, me me and a child living in poverty like it's such a weird idea to me and then the whole relation of that and then when we're talking about images of people's trauma being passed around on social media to bring like awareness to racism but really why should you have to see people in their worst moments literally going through the most traumatic hellish thing ever why should that be the thing that spurs someone and why should we have that so normalized because you never see you never see someone white someone european in that same position you would never see that and you would never see that without a trigger warning without like I find it so just the whole politics of photography basically and video and the way people are organized and documented I think that 
I don't know, the archive kind of brought that all together for me. Um, I think for me, it's um, this, this sort of like um, intersects with everyone's points. But I think one thing that kind of stuck out to me was like um, the power of like reducing people into like commodities. I think that concept, um, not, not, not that it wound me up, but like I think that, that the idea that people were reduced to as such um, really, really got to me. And like, um, I think this links with Antonia's poem um, when she does the thing at the start and at the end um, about like, oh, taking pictures, no face mask, like no face mark, sorry, and straighten hair and stuff like that. And it's, it's the idea that like a few percentage of people um, have just sort of brought it upon themselves to sort of, you know, um, to, to sort of see what they can't recognize. And instead of like, you know, appreciating it, and you know actually learning about other cultures that they might not know of and maybe even just to you know just to learn and appreciate the view um they sort of taken over and sort of just like you know diminished everything and i think the the fact that um i guess some like most of us can't really trace back to our own histories properly without um colonization being a huge part of it or like um in the history books like like I never saw my history like literally like when I was learning history in school the only part of um, my country that I saw was in relation to scramble for Africa and it's it, it's it's the things like that it's just like I can't I can't put it to words but like it, it really wounds me up and um, I guess um, using this medium is sort of a way to not get back at them but to sort of take what I can have and to sort of embrace it and to also listen to everybody else but um, also sort of remake my own sort of history and to make sure it's, you know, as solid as possible. And yeah, I just, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want my history to be taken away from me again. So, yeah. Antonia, I might have to cut you off here. However, you can weave your answer to this question into the next question, um, which nicely segues from what Destiny was saying about not necessarily seeing this in the history books that she's had access to as, as a British person from the African diaspora. Um, and the questions um, that came up that kind of relate to this was from Ezra, hey, and Laula, hey. Um, Ezra, who said, um, how can we take lessons from poems such as If, which touch on similar themes that we as Nigerians convey in our own form? Um, how can you take lessons from poems that really talk about these, like, um, sometimes concealed histories that have been hidden from us and, and sometimes histories that have been hidden because they contain so much violence um, that empires want to hide. How do we learn from, from work and art like this? And then um, Laula said, um, what do you think is a good way in starting a conversation with children about colonization? Um, she's got a younger sister and wants to think about ways that she can have these conversations. Um, are there good books that you know? How would you approach um, this topic? And I can talk about um, potentially having a conversation with children, just as like a side point. Um, I'm currently running a campaign talking about how we can get um, decolonized practices into schools, as well as having more inclusive and critical curriculums. And I think it starts from, well, it starts from a young age, but it also starts from understanding when people become conscious about this stuff. And one of the things that um, I've definitely explored uh, by campaigning around this stuff is the fact that we learn history in a linear way in this country, which means when we learn about pre-colonial histories, they most likely, that teaching most likely happens between the ages of let's say seven to 12, when you are not conscious or necessarily critical about some of the themes that we've explored today. So probably some of you have learned about African empires in your primary schools, but that is something that you then don't learn about in secondary schools when you're, in, you're able to talk critically about the history of empire, the history of Britain. Um, and I definitely think that when we are approaching these conversations, we have to have them across the board. You can't just teach one or three lessons in primary school about ancient Egyptians and then expect us at 21 to be able to critically talk about colonial structures and their impact on on Africa. So that's one thing that when um, the stuff that you learn in, in primary school about these empires, they, it needs to be continual. And if you're teaching your, your younger sister about this, make sure that within lessons, if once she hits secondary school, that is not something that, that then gets left out. Um, and I don't know, for you guys, what would be your response to this 
this question, these questions about what we can learn and how we can embed this into like education. Actually, uh, it's you told me about the project that you were doing, and it's so interesting because I just started writing um, an essay on decolonizing the university, um, which I think is so important. But for the first question that was made, but besides that, I would love to talk to you after this, so we can, you know, help me with my essay. But besides that, um, for the first question of how can we learn from art, um, like lessons and I think there are so many things to say about this not only really listening to what it says but behind that there is a huge meaning and is that knowledges were crucified when western colonial knowledge came and instituted universities and schools and now we from all around the world we study eurocentric history so basically south america latin america India, Asia, Southeast Asia, Asia, learn about the history of the world from an Eurocentric perspective where we are not even included. So we learn history that doesn't have anything to do with us. Um, and it's crazy for, because for example, Mexico was one of the seven big civilizations um, of the world. And this is not included in the history that we learned in Europe, which is the one all around the world. And when this happened, when this, when we, we have instituted this knowledge, Eurocentric knowledge, another thing that it did was not only really minimize the history of the world, but also completely deny something that is called, I believe, Toxa. I'm not really sure, but I'll check that, which is the knowledge that is the common knowledge, the knowledge out of experiences, the knowledge out of the soul, the knowledge out of the body, because the body is so wise. Your body is so wise, retains so much memory, retains so much experience. And all of this knowledge that grew from inner to out was crucified as not enough crucified as not scientific or, or rational or not knowledge. So when we do poetry and we take this out of our hearts and we, we put things that as Destiny was saying, I cannot find words to, yeah, there is no words for these things because it was crucified. These are languages that, that do not exist yet, but we have to start making them because languages are such a like, such a uh, structure, very, very uh, penalized things to be able to express the self, especially because all of the things I'm telling you now. So what we can learn from art is not only what it says, but also the fact that when you express your soul, it is also valid. It's also knowledge that is valid. It's also knowledge that we need. It's also history. It's also, you know, has power in it and power to change the world. So more, most, I believe that more important that listening to the poems is to understand the knowledge that it brings and, and the capacity to express your soul because for so long that was colonized. So colonization was not only of the land, colonization was not only of the borders, colonization was of the self, Silence, silencing us, yeah, making us silent. And so how can you learn from art? Just you know, appreciate the process of opening the heart to make knowledge and, and really believe that it's valid knowledge. That is my point on it, my two cents. Yeah. yeah um, hi, everyone. Sorry, my phone literally, it just shut down. I don't know what happened, but I'm here. I hope I haven't missed too much. Um, yeah, so I, that was amazing. I completely agree. I think something that is so important with poetry is actually the poet themselves because I know for myself when I write it's very personal like even if I have a, a stem or a, an idea that's that's to do with a global issue like I don't know gender inequality or like this colonialism I somehow I take it almost back to myself and to what I've seen because I mean as humans I think we are almost innately selfish to the point where I think when we write we do put parts of our lives in our work um, and so I feel like one of the key things with a story is who tells the story, the storyteller. And I think that if we're going to learn anything from art, we're going to learn that the storyteller is always going to be a part of the story. And I feel like with colonialism, we've seen that because if we look at the Bible, for example, 
white people said that Jesus was white, but that would not have been technically true at all. And I think that when we tell a story, we want it to fit our narrative. We want it to look the way we look. We want it to look the way our worlds look. So I think if we're gonna have any actual progress in society, I think we need to look at art and see ourselves as writers who put our souls into our work. And that's what the world needs to do. If we're gonna change something, it would be good if someone who would actually be affected by the problem would speak on how we change it. So if we're gonna talk about racism in politics, it would be good if actual ethnic minorities were the ones with the power at the top to make the changes. So I think it's all about the person and I think it's about whose perspective we look at the world from. <laughs> Silent class. Thank you. I agree. I 100% agree. agree. Um, and sorry to be in the spoil sport, but um, because we're coming up to 8.30, I'm going to do the last four questions all in one as they link uh, very nicely. Um, and then open it up. I'll ask the first one to in you specifically and then the rest to um, the larger group. So Tatenda um, said, um, well, I'm saying hi. Hi. <laughs> um, but Tatenda said, in your in the first poem, it felt as though you were jumping between times and locations interwoven into one moment. Was this poem compiled from many different poems or following one main narrative? So that was the first question. And then the next three, which all kind of link to um, what Tito and Antonio were saying about poetry, um, was uh, John said, well done all, just a question on why the archive was a starting point. Um, read J. Bernard, a beautiful collection that also delves into the archive and wonder if this had inspiration. So poetry and the archive, um, why the archive was st the starting point. I guess I can speak to that. Um, Lily said, what inspired you all to get um, into poetry in general? And then Emmanuel Andrews, hi. Um, so thank you for this beautiful space. Could you tell us on how, could you talk to us about how the medium of poetry has specifically allowed you to reflect on the North Coke Thomas archive? Like what does poetry allow you to do or not do? What limits does it give you? What freedoms does it give you? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly respond to John Leslie's about why we started it from Northcote and then Inua and then the whole group can respond to the rest of them. Um, so we started with the Northcote um, Thomas Archive um, as it was a project that was um, pitched to the South London Gallery and um, we thought it'd be really interesting to explore uh, what a West African colonial archive looked like today, specifically being young people who Again, in schools, we don't learn about this stuff. And again, we are living in, in like a present moment and reflecting on the past. It was just a really interesting dynamic to be able to um, delve into. And so that's why we started as Flow Fridays um, using the archive as a, a center point because um, and me being part of Art Assassins and this being a South London gallery hosted event, we wanted to create work that fed into a project that was already ongoing. Um, now in you are uh, responding to your first poem. Um, that the first poem I read is an old, old poem. Um, it's about nine years old. And actually, no, probably older than that, maybe more like a decade. And um, <laughs> I was asked to write about the slave trade. And I thought, I'm not doing that. I'm going to write about clubbing instead. And that is the title of the poem. So, which is why it flicks back and forth and it conjures the image of just going out dancing with your friends, but also um, at the same time occupies um, a, a slave narrative and, and, and goes through the journey of um, being taken from your friends, being taken from a bad family, being forced into impossible situations where there's a master. I think um, I thought about a DJ um, or an MC, the master of the ceremony and um, a, a slave hand, for instance, um, forcing you to do things that don't comply with your body, with your natural spirits. And, um, and, and the closing final image is freedom, is escape, that after clubbing glow, when you're tired, you're a little bit drum drunk, and the night air is kissing um, your flesh as you escape and you're riding, riding home. But also the release of freedom in my head, I consider being led out by Harriet Tubman through South, um, um, Southern America, right, right away up towards the North. So yeah, it flicked between um, just going out dancing in present day London and what it might have been um, all the way back then. Yeah. 
Oh, that was amazing. Um, I really like the idea of like reappropriating a theme as well. As a poet, I think that leads on to the question about um, what does poetry allow you to do? And it allows you to really expand on something that people give boxes to and then open it up into questions, open it up into like a mulch of your lived experience as well as like forcing yourself to live outside of yourself. Like you, in the process of writing, I'm always thinking about how I feel, but also how the audience will then receive the work. Um, and I think it's a constant kind of um, work to, a constant process to really recreate something that someone gives you as this objective thing, this objective photo, this objective piece of art and build it into like a multi-sensory experience, which is about you embodying that space, but you also giving someone else a narrative to take away with them. Like once you tell a story, it's not yours and poetry enables you to really have um, a, a interaction with people that just looking at a photo doesn't necessarily give you. Um, what about you guys? What does poetry allow you to do um, specifically with this archive? And what got you into poetry writing? Um, okay, so I got into poetry pretty recently. It was like this time last year, um, I was in Barbados and it was Emancipation Day. Um, and so I was, it was, it was like a whole celebration, I guess. Um, with poetry, spoken word, um, with dancing and drums and things like that. And I was really inspired just by the way how like the artists use the various media and use words to um, just tell their version of events and celebrate um, and yeah, relish in um, yeah, themselves and their history. And so from that, like, I, I was like, oh, let me give poetry a go. Let me just see how things go. Um, and so, yeah, there were just periods of time where I'd try it out a bit. Um, and then like over the course of lockdown, I think I've just had more time to, yeah, be with myself and to write more poetry. But yeah, it's been ongoing really since last year. Um, and I'd say that it's really a process of like introspection. Like so much of poetry is, just looking inside of yourself and reflecting that, um, but also just looking at the external things as well, um, and yeah, combining the two really. Um, for me, I was about six years old, and I just remember being um, my mum. My mum is one of those mums where if I, I just did one thing, she'd say whoa, you're amazing, you know, we have to bring something out of this, you're so talented, you're a star, that's my mum, and I wrote a poem about her, it was about, um, it was about how she would go to these shopping centres, and she would buy, like, these kind of boxes of, like, uh, sweets, peanuts, things like that, it was just very random, I was six years old, and I needed words to rhyme, like, i still today I'm obsessed with rhyming so I just kind of stuck some words together and it was about my mum and I don't know and then the teacher called my mum in and said whoa she she can make words rhyme she's six years old this is amazing um and then my mum just said okay we're going to enter you into competitions we're going to get you published in like child books and stuff and then from there I just I just kept writing and I think as I'm older now I understand obviously the world more and as I've got more interested in social issues, so things to do with gender, race, whatever, I it's been so cool to to then put the two together because I have somewhere to channel how I feel about the world. So yeah. Um, final thoughts from everybody um, as we are in we are five minutes over, but if anybody wants to um, say any final comments um, about the process about poetry. Um, I do, I have something very important to tell you that I want to make a little bit public. I hope you apologies. I want to thank Akira because there was one moment when the Black Life Movement started that it was very, very, I think, overwhelming for all of us. Um, and it was, I always consider myself as the other because I'm Latina in a white country and all of this. But then suddenly it shook me, I'm a white Latina. And therefore I have a lot of privilege that also blinded me. And at that moment, 
um, I was already into this. I was gonna do it and we were, I think we, we were practicing or something. And I wrote a super long email to Akira telling her that maybe it wasn't my place to speak, that I felt that I was occupying a space that maybe a black poet could use right now because I know that poetry is a healer and a, and a resistance form at the same time. And what she gave me back of that email will always stay with me. She told me two things that are very important. And firstly, she told me that, yes, it's important to acknowledge the space you occupy, but also very important to understand that this is not a segregation fight, that this is all of us on it. And that the most important part is to get justice for those who suffer the most. And that the impact of my words was important and they had a weight and, and that they needed to go out. And she gave me a place and she, she gave me, like she gave me, she made me feel that it mattered. And, and I just wanted to thank you because it was my first, this is my first poetry event. And I feel like I, you gave me that bust and, and you show me what is truly important that although it might not be my fight, they, it's not about segregation, it's about really fighting for justice with all your heart and all your art and everything you have. So yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Antonia, for contributing to this space. It's 100% true, like your words today. And I think all of us as artists reflecting on this is not, it's not about the fact that we are who we are, it's about the fact that we are doing what we are doing and that we're doing it with intention. And I think um, in all of these conversations, the small ways and sometimes large ways that we can contribute to this it is not just being from a certain community. Um, it's about demanding, again, yeah, justice for the people who deserve it most. And, and in these conversations about colonialism, we can't forget that there are real life implications for this stuff, um, that we are literally living in a context where people are experiencing brutality, experiencing poverty because of colonial legacies. Um, and, and anyone who has a voice to speak on that um, in a way that, that helps the people who, who are facing these consequences the most, you're valid and you're seen and, and you need to be in these spaces. So thank you, Antonia, for, for being that in this space. And thank you to everybody um, who came out tonight to be part of this conversation. And thank you to all the poets here, um, Victor, Rosa, Inua, thank you for coming, Tito, Destiny, Sadie, um, and Tommy and Paul for hosting this tonight. Um, yeah, this was beautiful. Have a lovely evening. Any final words? If not, feel free to cut me off, Paul. And Wait. <laughs> Is there enough time for... I would think just, just on what Antonio was saying, is like thinking about like working with Rerouted and everything. I kept thinking about just the point that people seem to think, you know, this whole idea of the whole racist mob turning up in London and being like, this is all British history, this is all history. And I keep thinking about this point that if they were so obsessed with British history, why do we not learn the truth? Like we talk about black history as if we're only gonna teach black Britons black history or as if it only included black Britons. But really, the whole myth of racism and everything includes class and all of these different things. And I think watching, Victor said to watch Les Blanc and I watched it and I was so, there was one point where he said, you know, I wish that it was so simple that the reason why I hated you was because you were white, but really what I really, like this man had traveled all of Europe, but he was um, from, it was like an unnamed West African country. But he said, really, I knew that colonialism was never for a love of the white race because he went to Europe and he saw Italians who were starving and he saw British people coming back from the coal mines, living in poverty and all of this stuff. And really, it was never, ever a thing about race that this was something that contributed to their greed. This was something like, this justifies it if we create a hierarchy or anything, because even when they first turned up there, when they first turned up in India, they were obsessed with the culture. It wasn't, they didn't turn up there and they were like, our culture's better, we're imposing it. They were obsessed with it and they wanted to be darker and all of this stuff. And I don't know, I just think that's an interesting idea that really it is all of our history. And the more people realize that maybe we'll have a much better country here in Britain.
that really Britain was never white. Britain was never a country without immigration. Britain was always a country of immigration. There's no such thing as Britain without it. So, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we, we've gone on a lot, but um, I just say that um, I hope that you've all enjoyed this and that you all take away something and use what you've learned. And I don't know, think back to our poems really um, and use it in your own lives and in your own work and whatever you may be doing to um, reflect um, and introspect. And I'd say that, yeah, to our, our um, Zoom call today has really been like a combination of imagination and insight. And all of us have hopes for like what the future can bring and how we can transform and translate our poetry into a form of political, like into a voice that um, has volume over the, the violence and the destruction that is in the world. And so, yeah, I hope you enjoyed and I hope you take forward um, our voices.